and here we are for season three episode four now i believe of our international perspectives on corpus technology for language learning co-organized by myself here at the university of queensland and our partners at the state university of sao paulo in brazil uh, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Kira Murakami, a world-leading expert on learner corpus linguistics uh, from the University of Birmingham, who's going to be talking today about second language development and the use of English grammatical morphemes, providing insights from a range of learner corpora. Um, I'm just going to kick off proceedings with a quick acknowledgement of country, which for those of you who've been attending each week know that something in Australian universities that where any public engagement, whether uh, on campus or in the virtual world, the University of Queensland likes to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country while recognizing their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So today's speaker, uh, Dr. Murakami, is a Birmingham fellow at the Department of English Language and Linguistics, University of Birmingham, and a visiting scientist at the Natural Language Understanding Team at the Center for Advanced Intelligence Project. His primary research interests include second language acquisition, corpus linguistics, and quantitative data analysis for applied linguistics research, is on the editorial boards of Studies in Second Language Acquisition and the International Journal of Learner Corpus Research. He's also been a postdoctoral researcher at the Universities of Birmingham, Cambridge and Tübingen. And I have to say, uh, Kira was an old uh, classmate of mine together at the University of Cambridge when I was studying there. Uh, I always looked up to him as somebody who really knew what he was talking about, somebody who was actually knowledgeable and able to do some of the, the very complex things that are uh, required of a corpus linguist. And uh, I always felt like just a, a pretender or a, somebody who didn't really know what they were talking about whenever I was in a conversation with him. So he said, it's a, it's a real pleasure to, to see him again, as we've met multiple times around the world. And, uh, uh, it's great to have him on for, for today's talk. So um, Akira, if you're ready to begin, uh, sharing your screen. Uh, we're going to take it from here. Yeah. Um, thanks, Peter, for a for, yeah, nice introduction. Yeah, I have quite, quite a lot of like, fond memories of, of uh, Cambridge with you. And yeah, it's good to see you um, virtually here as well. Um, OK, let me share the screen here. Um, do you all see the screen? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, so, um, sorry, let me. All right, so my talk is titled How to Development and Use of English Grammatical Morphemes and Insights from Lana Popra. Um, in this talk, I will illustrate the use of large scale Lana Popra in second language acquisition or SLA research with the development and use of L2 English Grammatical Morphemes as an example. Um, so from a more from a broader perspective, until the early 2010s or around it, there has not been much research um, um, at, the at the intersection between learner corpora and second language acquisition or SLA. But more recently, there has been the publication of special issues, books, and papers in flagship journals in SLA at that interface. And as the use of Lana Corpora is becoming increasingly common in L2 research, it's also becoming um, increasingly important for us to understand the nature and characteristics of Lana Corpora's data, um, as well as how to analyze uh, that relatively new um, data type. Um, from the perspective of SLA, Lana Opera, in a way, just a type of uh, free production data, and that that that's not uncommon. Um, even the earliest studies in SLA employed free production data, and Dulay and Bert in 1974 um, called their data corpuses. So it's not new at all. Um, the ESF there is um, can, if you know what it is, uh, can also be considered as a precursor to modern data corpora. Um, 
by taking this view, discussion around use of production data in UCLA is often directly applicable to uh, Lana Corpora and vice versa. So something like um, an EUT or avoidance issues um, 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 apply both to um, the production data in SLA and Lana Corpora. And so many methodological issues and also analytical techniques are shared between um, Lana Corpora and other types of production data. With um, each metadata, for example, it is possible to perform something like a common analysis with a Lana Corpora. And as you can indeed um, um, compared um, the final difference between no verb versus don't verb um, in small number of learners. Um, that said, a prominent feature of modern Lana Corpora is their scale or their size. And researchers often exploit the size or scale in conducting to research based on Lana Corpora. So in the, the ESF database that I mentioned earlier only included 40 um, adult learners, whereas uh, a modern a modern Lana Corpora, large scale Lana Corpora, can include uh, tens of thousands of learners. No. Now, why, okay, so why is it good that we have um, larger data size? Um, larger data size does not necessarily mean that findings are uh, generalizable. As you probably all know, um, unless the corpus is uh, representative, we cannot generalize the findings. No matter how much skewed data we have, we cannot generalize the findings. But larger data size uh, means um, the analysis have higher statistical power, which in turn means small differences can be reliably identified quantitatively. And also um, infrequent features um, um, can, can also be investigated with a reasonable power. Um, it is, for example, difficult to investigate infrequent features like say um, object relative clauses based on only 200 um, essays but it is possible to do so with 10,000 or a few hundred thousand essays. Um, secondly, larger data size also means that we can perform uh, something called the multifactorial analysis, which I'll explain um, in a minute. And that in turn leads to larger scope and, uh, and finer granularity. And th this is the, the, the uh, part of the learning corpus aspect that I'll focus on uh, and will emphasize uh, in this talk. Um, the quantity of data in Lana Corpora allows us to answer the research questions that we would not have been able to um, without them. So um, one trend in Lana Corpora's research is from monofactorial risk studies to multi-factorial uh, studies. And by monofactorial studies, uh, what is meant is that we have a single um, predictor. So say we predict and the accuracy of grammatical morphemes um, um, as a function of lexical aspect alone. Whereas multifactorial studies are where we can we, we use multiple predictors for a single phenomenon. So we say predict um, the accuracy of grammatical morphemes as a function of lexical, lexical aspect, word frequency, uh, the native language of, of the learner, proficiency, task effects, and so forth. Um, Multifactorial analysis are generally preferred in Lana Corpus research. Um, since practically any phenomenon in secondary language research is influenced by a number of factors, multifactorial analysis are generally more desirable than monofactorial analysis. In particular, um, in corpus analysis, um, various factors um, like tasks, L1, proficiency, and others. Um, often need to be controlled for in a post hoc manner um, through statistical analysis, unlike um, typical experiments where, um, um, where um, researchers can control for these factors um, more experimentally. So multifactorial right, so multi analysis are necessary or useful in, in learner corpus research. And by using multifactorial analysis, uh, we uh, the, the research leads to larger scope because they incorporate multiple 
um, predictors. So we can generalize over, uh, um, over say, proficiency in L1 and maybe some other variables at the same time. So the, the findings have larger scope. Multifactorial analysis also lead to uh, finer granularity because they can disentangle different sources of variability in the data. Um, based on the ice corpus, uh, uh, Rational Horror and Dash Dishes, for example, showed that genres in L2 varieties interact with other varieties like lexical aspect in the use of progressive ING. And this sort of um, interactions between variables um, is much easier to be invest investigated um, um, using uh, large scale lana corpus uh, combined with multifactorial analysis. Um, let me now illustrate um, how multifactorial analysis can be used in the study of grammatical morphemes. And for this purpose, I will introduce my own work on the accuracy of L2 English grammatical morphemes and how it has benefited from using large scale lana corpora. Um, so grammatical morphemes as you know, are known to be notoriously difficult for um, L2 learners to acquire. Uh, morpheme development is typically a slow and gradual process. So it's not all or nothing. It, it, it's, it's a continuous gradient uh, process. And not all inflected forms are as easily acquired. So some morphemes have been argued to be acquired earlier than others, like progressive energies acquired earlier than, uh, than um, third person S, for example, as has been shown in typical uh, morpheme order studies. And also within each morpheme, um, certain forms, certain inflected forms are acquired earlier than others, like uh, as in uh, claimed in aspect hypothesis. Uh, so a verbal morpheme like ing, for example, is acquired earlier in certain classes of verbs than in other classes. As far as the ing is concerned, uh, people have been arguing that it's acquired earlier in, say, activity verbs uh, before, uh, like dance or uh, than, um, accomplishment verbs like right work, for example. So there has been, yeah. Um, um, so people have been sh showing or disclaiming that um, there have been um, um, like between morpheme differences and also within morpheme differences. And um, um, we have, I have carried out um, research uh, in both of these areas uh, based on Lana Corpora, and I'll illustrate um, each of them in turn. And so, first of all, um, um, the differences between uh, morphemes. Um, in, this is a classic. This is a sort of classic uh, morpheme order studies, and and we in a way uh, replicated or investigated um, um, the effect of L one on um, the acquisition order of grammatical morphemes. Um, so it has been believed, oh, this had been believed in SLA that the L two acquisition order of English grammatical morphemes is universal, irrespective of learners. L1 um, in, in Crash in 1977 claimed um, that, that what's shown here is the natural order or the universal order that people or learners follow in the acquisition. So they, they first acquire ING, plural S, copular B before they acquire auxiliary B in articles, which in turn are acquired earlier than irregular past tense, which in turn is acquired earlier than regular past tense, third person S policy S. Luke and Shirai, however, suggested that, uh, that L1 seems to affect the order by, um, they, so they looked at the previous literature and, and, and suggested that L1 does affect the order. So the aim of our study was uh, to empirically test uh, the universality of um, the order based on Alana Corpus data. Um, so the data we used was a subcorpus of the Cambridge Learner Corpus, which includes the exam scripts of Cambridge English Main Street exams, um, which are aligned with the CFL proficiency levels. Um, 
CLC has been manually error tagged. And so we can use those error tags to calculate um, accuracy, to identify errors and to calculate uh, the accuracy of grammatical morphemes or other features. Um, we looked at seven uh, typologically diverse um, L1 groups, Japanese, Korean, Spanish, Russian, Turkish, German, and French. And um, the subcorpus included approximately 12,000 essays. Um, we looked at the six morphemes shown here. So articles, past in CD, plural S, positive S, progressive energy, and third person S. These are um, the morphemes that have been most often targeted in previous uh, morpheme order studies. We then calculated what's called the TLU score, target like use score, which is the accu an accuracy measure of each morpheme in each L1 group in each proficiency level based on the error annotation. Uh, we looked at um, accuracy because acquisition order has been um, um, usually operationalized as the accuracy order in previous research. Um, the details aside, here's um, the accuracy order um, that we found at the B1 level. Um, if you look at the leftmost column in Japanese, uh, what it says is in the past tense ED and progressive energy were more accurate than plural S and third person S, which in turn were more accurate than articles in positive S. So the morphemes in cluster one um, um, were more accurate, what well, well, had higher TLU scores than the morphemes in cluster two, which in turn had um, higher accuracy scores than uh, those in cluster three. But there was, there was no statistically significant difference in the accuracy uh, between the morphemes within the same um, cluster. Um, we can, so, okay, if you look at articles, um, we can see that articles are one of the least accurate morphemes in L1 Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Turkish learners, whereas it is, uh, they are one of the highest, uh, one, of the, one of the most accurate morphemes in the other three L1 groups, uh, Spanish, German, and French, um, likely because Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Turkish are article-less languages, whereas uh, Spanish, German, and French have uh, roughly equivalent features to um, the English article. Similarly, if you look at the position of progressive energy, they are somewhere in the middle in L1, German, and French, whereas it is one of the most accurate morphemes in the other L1 groups. Um, this, is also, uh, this is likely to be because um, German and French do not have um, um, the equivalent features to progressive energy, whereas, whereas the other L1 groups do. The pattern remains the same um, across the proficiency, proficiency levels. So this is a C2 level, the highest proficiency level. And here too, you can see articles are uh, fairly uh, located fairly low, um, in L1 Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Turkish, whereas they are uh, one of the most accurate morphemes in the other L1 groups. And similarly, progressive energy is um, towards the end of the uh, six morphemes in L1 German and French, whereas it is uh, one of the most accurate morphemes in the other, uh, other L1 groups. Um, just, uh, another way to look at the data or more like a summary of um, the differences between L1 groups um, in the accuracy of the grammatical morphemes. Um, here, for example, what it says is, so it wants Spanish, German, and French learners of English, so SGF, um, the rank order of the articles is higher than in L1 Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Turkish learners of English, so JKRT. It basically shows that the, uh, whether there's a, there's a difference in the accuracy order between L1 groups. Um, across um, processing levels and, 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 and across morphemes. And you can see that there are differences um, both between, uh, both across the morphemes, uh, sorry, sorry, across the morphemes and also across the proficiency levels. So regardless of the proficiency level, regardless of the, of the morphemes, there are accuracy difference, uh, differences in, in the order. On the other hand, if you look at the differences um, of the orders within each L1 group, um, there's not much um, difference. So here I looked at whether there's a difference in the accuracy order between proficiency levels uh, within each L1 group. And what, what it shows is basically that the, the accuracy order is fairly consistent within each L1 group across proficiency levels. So the, even if the learner's proficiency goes up, the accuracy order itself does not change. 
And large scale COPAS data um, allowed us to compare um, between L1 and within L1 differences, which uh, Jarvis argues is necessary uh, for us to claim um, L1 influence. Um, and there, uh, well, at least yeah, that, that's how I interpreted uh, Jarvis's work. And th th therefore, it confirms or supports our claim that what we observe here is indeed um, L1 um, influence. Uh, we then, um, well, incidentally, here's the natural order um, of Krashen. And um, we then directly compared the orders we observed in, in the CLC, the corpus, and, um, and the natural order shown here. Um, here, um, NO stands for the natural order, and, and the other, the rest is the, the uh, same as before. And what this table shows is that there are a few differences with the natural order um, in possessive S and third person S. So the, yeah, the order of accuracy um, um, is similar between the natural order and what was observed in the data as far as positive S and third person S were concerned. And it's a, it's a, it's a surprising, it's surprising in the case of positive S because Luke and Shirai found the robust effect of a long on its acquisition. Also, um, the accuracy order of L1 Spanish learners by English does not seem to deviate from that natural order. So there's, in this table, there's no S um, indicating Spanish um, learners of English. So their acquisition order or their accuracy order um, um, is consistent with the natural order. And that supports Luke and Shirai's hypothesis that the so-called natural order is just a reflection of the order of acquisition by Spanish learners of English. So to, to uh, briefly summarize um, um, this study, um, despite the numerous claims for that natural order, that does not seem to be a fixed accuracy order in L2 English grammatical morphemes. And the pieces of evidence provided in this study should be more than sufficient to cast a strong doubt on the universality of the accuracy order. And the use of a large scale learner corpus or the Cambridge learner corpus allowed us to perform a study with a relatively large scope. So we, we could look at six morphemes in seven L1 groups in five proficiency levels. And this would have been difficult to do uh, without um, using a, a reasonably uh, large learner corpus. Um, okay, so uh, let me now turn to um, the research looking at the, the, the accuracy order or the the dif difference in accuracy within each morpheme. So whereas morpheme order studies were uh, popular a few decades ago in the like, 1970s and 80s, research on the acquisition order within the same morpheme is perhaps a more active area of research uh, more recently. Um, so so um, in this recent paper of ours, we looked at the effects of usage-based distributional factors like frequency on the accuracy of the grammatical morphemes. Um, from the perspective of usage-based theories, um, distributional properties in the input like frequency and contingency affect the use of processing and acquisition as well as the accuracy of use. Um, now, what kind of distribution characteristics influence the accurate versus erroneous use or no use on inflection or morphemes? Um, we looked at three uh, factors here, um, availability, contingency, and formulaicity. Availability refers to how often learners experience a particular form in their input. And one very straight, straightforward way to measure availability is on the surface form uh, frequency. So if, for example, the word wanted is more frequent than the word graduated, then the accuracy of fast and CD um, is ex expected to be higher in wanted than in graduated. So that, uh, and that's the idea of, of availability or frequency. And that, uh, that has been widely demonstrated to impact the processing acquisition and use in both L1 and L2. 
in L1 acquisition research has also shown that high frequency surface forms are less prone to errors. And we expect the same in L2 as well. Contingency refers to a probabilistic association between Q and outcome. And in the present study, the Q is the lemma and outcome is the target inflected form. So given the lemma, um, can we predict um, the target for inflected form? And one measure of contingency is reliability, which is calculated by dividing the frequency of the inflected form divided by, uh, 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 by, by the frequency of the lemma. So in this small table that's shown here, um, um, I listed the frequency counts of, of different forms of uh, lemma arrives, so arrive, arrived, arrives, and arriving, uh, and the total frequency of lemma arrive um, based on COCA. And the rightmost column shows the ratio of each form. Um, we can see that the form arrived occupies 56% of all the occurrences of the lemma arrived, which means that whenever um, um, uh, people use the lemma arrive, um, well, well that, okay, that means um, um, the lemma arrive um, is likely to be associated with the past tense form arrived more strongly than with, say, um, third person S form arrived with, because um, arrived is more frequently used when lemma arrive is used. And so this ratio is a reliability. And it captures the skewness of the distribution of different forms within the same lemma, which in turn entails the strength of association. So th this is basically the reliability of the Q uh, between uh, uh, the lemma and the form. When the lemma arrive is used, it's often used to indicate um, events in the past. That, so that, that's an association. Um, and so it, it's expected to be to be um, to be easier to process arrive in past tense than, than in present tense. Um, contingency influences the associati associative learning between a Q and um, outcome. And the reliability of the association has been shown to affect L1 and L2 processing acquisition and use. Um, now, formulicity is the extent to which a given word sequence is a fixed, prefabricated, or memorized expression. A more formulaic language is processed faster and acquired earlier than this formulaic language. Formulaicity is typically operationalized by either frequency or association strength, but using frequency alone can be problematic. Um, for example, uh, in the expression, okay, the expression a lot of Americans is quite frequent as a program. Um, but it, it, it's only because the sequence of the, uh, the first uh, trigram, so a lot of, is frequent and not necessarily because there's an inherent association between a lot of and Americans. And in order to measure uh, this kind of um, um, association, be association, or, yeah, association between uh, um, elements, a better, a possibly better measure is, um, is delta P. Is a metric that quantifies the associative strength, association strength between Q and outcome. And one characteristic of delta P is that it is unidirectional. Um, and in quantifying um, collocational strength of, of a course, for example, um, the delta P value with of as a Q and course as its outcome. So basically, um, how much can we predict course? given of um, is different from the delta P value with the course as a Q and of a, as its outcome. So given the course, uh, um, uh, to what extent can we predict of? So there's a difference between the two and that's a unique feature of delta P in comparison to um, other um, collocational statistics like MI or log dice and the most other uh, collocational statistics used today. Um, in the present study, um, um, the context surrounding the target word served as the cue of the target um, infected form, which was the outcome. And I'll give you a concrete example later. 
against this background, Goen Ellis recently examined the effects of availability, reliability, and formulicity through elicited imitation tasks. So through, a, through an, uh, an experimental technique. Um, they looked at Chinese learners of English and, and these four morphemes here, so past and CD, progress energy, third person S, and plural S. What they did was they asked the participants to listen to a sentence, including one of the four morphemes, and type it on a computer, or to type the sentence um, as a whole on the computer. Um, and they looked at the effects of availability, contingency, and formulaicity, um, um, which was operationalized as the frequency of programs in, in their study, um, on the accuracy of the suppliance of those morphemes. And those availability, contingency, and formulaicity were calculated based on COCA. They showed that availability and contingency influenced the accuracy of morphine provision in South person S and Twitter S. Um, the effect of contingency was particularly strong in lower uh, proficiency learners. Formulicity was associated with accuracy as well. But due to the experimental nature of the work, its scope was somewhat limited. They only looked at um, Chinese learners of English, and the number of words was, um, was relatively small as well. And also, um, whereas the illicit limitation task can experimentally control for a variety of factors, like ling linguistic contexts, it potentially threatens um, ecological validity too. Um, now, they, they are, there are differences between the illicit imitation task that they, they used and the free production um, data that we looked at in our study. Um, so the, the illicit imitation task uh, involves implicit linguistic knowledge or at least automatized uh, explicit knowledge. Um, and it involves perceiving words, linking, them, uh, linking those words syntactically, and interpreting the sentence. And in all of these, these steps, um, input factors like availability, contingency, and formalicity uh, play a role. And uh, we observed uh, more pronounced frequency effects in online processing tasks, like illicit imitation tasks, than in production tasks, too. On the other hand, um, free writing tasks um, involves explicit processing which might mitigate the effect of uh, distribution of factors stemming from implicit processing. Uh, so uh, free writing is basically a conscious process. Uh, learners can pay attention to forms and uh, we can, uh, we can, so learners can edit writings as well. So there, there's a, there can be a considerable difference uh, between, uh, uh, sorry, difference in, uh, sorry, there can be a considerable difference in the effects of uh, distribution of factors between easy to limitation tasks and free writing tasks. Let me see how, how they uh, might impact um, um, the results of our study. Um, so the aim of our study was to conceptually replicate and extend Goen Ellis's experimental study by drawing data from a large scale learner corpus of L2 writing. Um, the analysis of a large scale corpus allows us to target a larger number and range of words and learners, leading to a study uh, with a larger scope and more fine grained picture of the effects of relevant factors. So we can look at the, uh, more learners, we can look at more words and so a larger scope. And the study specifically examined whether the use of grammatical morphemes is more accurate in more available and more reliable words, as well as in more formulaic contexts, and whether the effects interact with other factors like, like learners' proficiency. So does, does the effect of frequency, for example, uh, um, get smaller when learners' proficiency goes up? So um, the corpus we used was EF Cambridge Open Language Database, EF Cambridge, which is freely available uh, from the URL given here. Um, the writings included in EF Cambridge come from uh, um, something called English Sound, which is 
the online school that used to be run by the company called EF Education First. Um, the course in English Town consisted of 16 levels, each of which included eight to six units. And at, at each unit, each student was asked to respond to a free writing task on a variety of topics. And, there, and those responses were included as um, in, in this learner corpus. EF Camdat currently includes 1.2 million writings by 175,000 learners. And two thirds of the writings come with teacher corrections, which we used as error annotation to calculate accuracy. And only we, we only looked at the error tagged writings because we, we looked at accuracy and to do that um, error annotation was necessary. Um, we looked at the same set of uh, morphemes as Go and Ellis' study, uh, namely past and CD, progress of energy, um, third person S and plural S. We only examined um, omission and misformation errors. Uh, we didn't look at um, over generalization errors because the expected direction of the effect of the factors differs between uh, those two types of errors, but I'll skip the details here. Um, we looked at these 11 nationality groups, uh, but their distribution is, is heavily skewed. Um, Brazilian learners um, occupy almost half of the learners uh, followed by um, um, Mexican or Chinese, Mexican, and German learners, um, each uh, contributing 6 to 13 percent. We only looked at a relatively, uh, okay, we only looked at the words um, that occur um, uh, more or less um, frequently in our, in, in the learner corpus. In verbal morphemes, we only looked at uh, the words with five or more occurrences in each of the CFR levels A1 through C1. Um, and in plural S, we employed a uh, different criteria to reduce its otherwise unmanageably large uh, data size. And, it is, and the table here shows the number of, numbers of learners, writings, words, and obligatory um, context. So we looked at uh, so that's like 30, 40,000 runners, uh, except for plural S, um, and, and uh, 50 to 80,000 writings. Um, the number of words was not particularly large, but still um, we looked at like 80, 200 to like 120 words. So um, availability, reliability, and formulacity were calculated based on COCA. Um, availability uh, uh, was operationalized as a log transformed surface form frequency of the inflected form used as a verb in the case of in, uh, verbal morphemes or noun in the case of plural S. Uh, words, with, words with high availability um, um, are those like used, getting, says, and years, whereas words with low reliability are the words like requested, raining, prefers, and supermarkets. Reliability is basically the availability and divided by uh, the frequency of the corresponding lemma. So um, words with high reliability are those like decided, trying, depends on inhabitants, whereas words with low reliability are the words like liked, thinking, thinks, and might. Um, so we use delta p um, in order to calculate uh, as a measure of formula ECD. Um, for instance, in the trigram, what happened yesterday, we considered uh, the contingency table of the frequency count of what something yesterday and something happened something. Um, and as shown in the table here, and if we do the, the bit of calculation, um, the delta P um, in this case is 0 0.84. And delta P takes the value between negative one and positive one, and the larger value indicates a stronger association between the Q and outcome. And in this particular case, uh, 0 0.84 suggests that we can predict happened uh, from what something yesterday fairly well. So, to, so this is a measure of to what extent we can predict um, the words or inflected form um, um, of, the, of the world uh, from uh, the surrounding words. And the context uh, are either um, trigrams, four grams, or five grams. And we, we calculated the delta P in all of these cases and, and picked up the the um the largest delta p as the value representing 
uh, the formulacity of the context in which the target word occurs. Um, so here are some expressions with high and low formulacity. The expressions with high formulacity include uh, the expressions like, since I graduated from college and time is running out, practice makes perfect, ladies and, gent and, ladies and gentlemen. So if you, um, so even if these underlying words are cut out, you can kind of guess uh, what kind of words fit in uh, the slot. So that, 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 uh, uh, that's what it means uh, uh, by high formulacity. On the other hand, expressions with low, low formulacity are the expressions like wanted a lot of, going is not, says do not, and in the ears of. Here, um, it, if you, um, you know, um, um, take out the underlying words, it's very difficult to guess what comes there. So it's low in formula ECT. So we built a, a regression model predicting um, the morpheme accuracy um, as a function of a number of uh, variables, um, including those, um, those, those three um, um, distributional factors, so the frequency, reliability, and delta P, um, as well as um, um, the proficiency levels, L1 type, and the number of writings, uh, so longitudinal, longitudinal development of the runner. Um, here's the, the random effect structure. This is close to what's called the maximal model, uh, except that interaction terms were not included as random slopes. Um, here's, here are the results. Um, and these are um, the parameters where uh, the 95% credible intervals did not include um, zero. Um, so we can see proficiency, which is the leftmost column, um, um, is positively associated with accuracy in all of these uh, morphemes and fast density progressive energy, thousand is plus S. And writing them representing a long um, is associated with um, prof, uh, with um, accuracy in the first two morphemes as well. Um, but when we turn to our focal um, variables, which are frequency, reliability, and and delta p, we can see that high reliability was associated consistently with higher accuracy of morpheme use in all the morphemes. So in, in all of these four morphemes, reliability uh, led to uh, well, at least was associated with um, 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 high accuracy. Availability and formulacity, however, were not consistently associated with morpheme accuracy. So why, why is it? Um, the lack of noticeable effects of availability and formulacity is interesting given their pervasive impact documented in the usage-based literature and more specifically in, in Go and Ellis study. We speculate this is uh, possibly due to uh, the nature of writing, which does not require online processing, saving, um, as I uh, briefly explained earlier. Um, the target words and also the operationalization of um, formula ECT. Um, in pre-writing, like in the Lana corpus that we use, used, learners respond to a prompt with whatever um, uh, linguistic forms associated with the ideas that they come up with. Um, but availability means that higher proficiency learners are able to use a wider range of items than lower proficiency learners. But we didn't quite examine, um, so what we examined is not really availability in this sense. What we examined was whether learners correctly inflected the lemmas that they, that, that came up to their mind in, the, in, that, in, their, in, the, in that context. And also, um, all of the target words in our study were fairly um, high in their frequency already. So we, we, looked, you know, we looked at the effects of frequency, but even the ones with low frequency were more or less frequent. So there was, there was like requested, for example, it, it's not particularly low in frequency. And so the frequency effects might have approached the ceiling already. Um, in terms of a formula ECT, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, illicit imitation tasks, tasks draw on implicit or automatized explicit knowledge, uh, whereas free writings uh, draw on explicit knowledge. 
And unlike um, the illicit imitation tasks requiring online processing, um, the conscious writing strategies you, that, that might be used in, in free writing may have overridden the effects of the distribution of factors that were offered up, to, uh, up from the implicit or automatized system. So the conscious um, efforts might have overridden um, um, the, the, the distributional effects. Editing, uh, for example, can disrupt what is first offered by the implicit system and moderate reliance on formulaic language. So you may uh, rely on formulaic uh, knowledge less when we edit uh, writing. And there are also issues or methodological issues with the operationalization of the construct of formulacity. We, for example, did not look at non-adjacent patterns like verb and its direct object or abstract patterns like part of speech sequences, um, both of which um, may influence um, um, the formulacity or, or what we consider as formulaic. There are also many other um, um, ways to calculate association strength like MI, score, n-gram frequency, and so forth. And delta P uh, may or may not be the best measure. And we've just sort of started uh, exploring this uh, uh, space of different measures. Uh, we, we, we just started looking at this economic formulacity um, and operationalized as association strength. And we are not yet certain which measure best captures uh, formulacity um, in general, or in this context, at least. Um, but the results on contingency were quite robust. And the positive association between reliability and accuracy in morpheme use suggests that the lemma functions as a cue of its inflected forms, and that L2 learners make use of the contingency um, in processing them. Reliability of the link between Q and outcome is in, in generally important in all kinds of associative learning, and contingency learning plays a central role in the competition model, which is a very well-known model in second language acquisition. In learning the association between Q and outcome, learners start with available cues and then increasingly rely on uh, reliable cues. That, that's what um, research on competition model on the competition model has demonstrated. Um, so to wrap up, um, systematic patterns observed in, in this study indicate that um, learners, L2 learners, are sensitive to the certain um, distribution of properties in their input. In particular, reliability is strongly associated with morpheme accuracy. Um, methodologically, this study exemplifies uh, multifactorial research by modeling the accuracy of grammatical morphemes as a function of a number of predictors including proficiency, L1, availability, contingency, and uh, formula ECD. Um, distributional patterns are only available through uh, large-scale corpora too. So we, we looked at Coker to, to, um, to identify or to calculate um, availability, reliability, and formula ECD. And that, that, they, that is only possible by using large-scale corpora. Um, the study also complements uh, a prior experimental study uh, through methodological uh, triangulation. So in this talk, I hope I have shown that there are quite a lot of things you can do with uh, large-scale learner corpora. Um, combined with multifactorial analysis, studies based on large-scale learner corpora showed that the L2 acquisition order of English grammatical morphemes differs across the learner's L1 backgrounds, and that contingency between inflected forms and their lemmas is robustly associated with morpheme accuracy, suggesting that L2 learners are sensitive to the within lemma distribution of inflected forms in their input. Large-scale learner corpora make it possible to perform a multifactorial analysis uh, or study that yields more fine-grained findings with a larger scope. All right, uh, that's it, thanks. Okay. Thanks so much to our speaker, Akira Murakami. Uh, it's always difficult with these online sessions to see, gauge the, uh, the temperature of the audience, but you can see that the claps are starting to come through in the chat. Um, 
Not so many questions at the present. I think maybe you've blown them away a little bit, um, which is you know, pretty typical when you get a fine, very detailed study like this that covers so many bases. Um, but we do have a couple. Um, first question is from uh, Jia Chi Guo, who asked if you use the uh, general uh, linear mix model for the modeling. Uh, if you did, can you elaborate on your choice of model a bit more? All right. Uh, sure. Let me let me go back to that. So um, for the first study, um, I don't know, actually, I didn't explain the, uh, the modeling part, so I don't have to do this. Okay, the second study, um, the one I did with, with Nick Ellis, um, I kind of skipped uh, the details of the, of the model, but um, wait, go oh, here it is. So what we used was a, a Bayesian version of a mixed fix model, and it was a binary uh, logistic regression model because what we predicted was whether um, particular use of um, the morpheme was accurate or not. So whether it was uh, it was either accurate or um, omitted or inaccurate, no, either omitted or mis yeah. mis um, old. And um, so that, that was a dependent variable. And the, and the predictors of fixed fix, uh, fixed fix uh, variables are, are the ones that are shown here. So the three uh, distribution factors like uh, um, frequency, reliability, and delta p as well as the overall proficiency of the learner operationalized as the English mean English sound level of the learner. Um, the learner's writing number representing longitudinal development. Uh, so, you know, one indicating uh, the first writing of the learner, two indicating the second writing of the learner, and so forth. And L1 type, which indicates whether an equivalent feature to the target morpheme was obligatorily marked in the, in the uh, language predominantly spoke in the country or region of the learner's nationality. So basically whether, um, say, I don't know, past tense ED uh, is obligatory in, in Japanese or in, in, in Spanish and so forth. Um, and the two-way interaction. So that was uh, the, um, the fixed effects variables um, of this model. And um, some effects, as I said, is was close to the maximal model. So we included um, by learner, nationality, effect form, and the topic of writing, random intercepts, as well as uh, the random swaps uh, shown here. So it was, it was in a way, a, a quite complex model. And uh, but due to um, but because we we have a relatively large data set, and also sorry, also due to the um, the use of Bayesian. Um, um, techniques, we were able to fit the model. And we, we, we did not do any uh, model selection or anything which was which has been discouraged in, in the statistics uh, literature yeah. recently. Okay, um, did I explain this enough? If you have other I, um, um I believe so, uh, Akira. No, I, th I think that's a good explanation. I guess my follow-up question would be, what's the advantage of a Bayesian model over your traditional uh, GLMM? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, right, in traditional or well, frequentist um, um, mixed fix models, there, there have been lots of issues in like, you know, convergence. There, there can be issues with the convergence of, um, of, the, of parameter estimation. And if you use um, the LME4 packaging R, which has been quite well used in, in, in the L2 research, we often get um, um, convergence warnings or errors. And um, that's because um, the algorithm fails to find an appropriate or reasonable value of the parameter. Whereas in Bayesian statistics, uh, we can give a sort of like, not, not a range, but we can give what's called priors. And uh, in, the, in the last line of the uh, black point here, I said weekly informative priors were used. And by that, what I mean what I meant was, uh, we gave some kind of information as to what kind of values are likely to, e, uh, to each parameter. And that helps um, um, the estimation of the parameter or the convergence a lot. And especially when the model is complex or the data size is small, um, mm. Bayesian statistical modeling um, tends to be more beneficial than, than uh, frequentist uh, modeling. 
Okay, thanks very much for the answer. Got another question now from uh, Paula, our uh, colleague from State University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, and this is regarding kind of the applied use of some of the findings here, particularly uh, the, the variation regarding first language type um, have you considered to publish a kind of reference resource uh, based on your findings for the variation by different nationalities? Right, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, okay, as far as the, the first study that I um, uh, presented is concerned, what we showed was, you know, the accuracy order um, differs between different L1 groups. And I don't necessarily think um, the accuracy order represents an appropriate or optimal um, order of interaction. To, to me, then the accuracy or the acquisition um, is separate from you know, teaching. You know. So um, even if you find that, I don't know, um, um, uh, say progressive energy is acquired earlier than to their S, and it's it is acquired earlier than article articles. That's not that does not necessarily represent the best order of teaching. And if we um, if you think about you know, how how best to teach or well, creating um, instructional materials, I think mm -hmm. we need a, need a different study uh, investigating um, doing some, some sort of sort of like intervention studies uh, investigating um, appropriate um, order. Of teaching or some some similar issues, yeah. so I think why we need at least one one more step, if not more, um, in order to apply uh, what we did to to um, to a new teaching. Yeah, I guess that was going to, to to bring me to my question, which was given that contingency seems to be um, a very important indicator of uh, of what you found. Uh, what are the ways that we might make that contingency more salient to language learners? And could uh, maybe data-driven learning have a role to play in making the contingency of these forms more salient? Because it seems to me that that's what studying concordances of given uh, structures would do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um... So the the conti okay the reliability that we looked at in this study is uh, fairly like inherent to individual words, um, and we we can see okay let me let me bring up the I mean here if, so reliability in a way is kind of like in trade off uh, between different forms so if the if the reliability of arrived increases the reliability of the other forms decreases. So it's, I, I don't think we can manipulate uh, the reliability uh, too much to, to facilitate language development. What we can do no. perhaps is to, to um, make salient the forms with low, low reliability. So we, we can kind of tell that um, um, arrives and arriving are likely to be prone to errors in comparison to arrive with. And so uh, no. we can and highlight or, or, or somewhat, somewhat make you know, arrives or arriving more salient in the input than, than arrived, or, or maybe target um, them as ex, uh, in the explicit interaction. So I think we need some other means to, uh, to, um, to facilitate uh, the acquisition of those forms. Thank you very much. Got a, a question from Crystal uh, who asks, uh, she has two part question. The first part, I think you've already answered, which is about the suggestions for morphine teaching. Uh, but the second part was related to interaction between the factors in the second study. So you've got a very complex model uh, with numerous kind of um, factors of both fixed and random effects. And of these different factors, um, can you summarize into, uh, what some of the interactions might have been? Yeah. So uh, we, uh, yeah, yeah. thanks for that question. I didn't um, um, explain that. But the reason I did not explain that was because uh, we did not find any meaningful interaction between any of the factors. Well, we did, we did a little bit, but, but uh, by and large, 
um, there was no meaningful um, interaction. And what the point is that there's no clear um, evidence suggesting that the effects of reliability, uh, frequency, and so forth um, changes um, as learner's proficiency goes up. So contingency or reliability um, is always associated with accuracy regardless of uh, learner's uh, proficiency levels. Mm -hmm. So this so this sort of like absence of interaction is what in a way what, what we uh, found in the in the analysis. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question, and the question has come from uh, again, forgive my pronunciation. I think it's a uh, Gui or Gui Wang. And uh, the question is that some scholars, for example, Greece, uh, have concerned high correlation between frequency and association, which means that they may account for a similar issue. Uh, first, some association or reliability metrics are maybe actually frequency metrics. And I know that um, Greece has come out with a paper recently that says, you know, something that not all, I think it's in the title, not, not, not yeah. all uh, association measures measure association. Uh, it's a typical mm -hmm. Greece type title. What are your thoughts on this um, and going forward? Yeah, thanks for that question. And that, 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 that's an interesting question, really. Um, so here, I don't, okay, so at, at, first of all, at the empirical level, I don't think there was much, um, there was a strong association between, well, in this case, and, um, and, um, and availability as a whole. But, but that's because we are looking at, so in, as far as this study is concerned, what we looked at was the frequency of individual words and the formulacity of the entire phrase. So they, they, they are some like, you know, different things. Um, so I don't think they were strongly correlated in this particular study. And I don't think it was a, it was a major issue. Um, more generally though, I, mean, I, I kind of see that uh, Greece's point that um, um, the frequency and formality can um, end up measuring the same thing. Although at the same time, I'm not sure if they should be separated. I mean, formulaicity, part of the reason that um, a formulaic language is formulaic is due to its frequency. So formulaic uh, a sequence is frequent and therefore comes to be you know, chunked together and, and, and it comes to be um, viewed as um, a formulaic in learner's mind. So in that sense, um, we've, I think we kind of need to um, um, elucidate or, or um, clarify the constructs first and, and it would be to clarify what we want to measure uh, through frequency, what we want to measure through formulacity, and we, whether we really want to, um, um, to what extent we want to separate the two constructs. And I think that's the sort of things that we, we um, corpus linguists need to uh, think about if we continue uh, looking at um, those factors. Okay, well, um, let's thank our speaker again, Akira, for gratefully uh, ask, ask, answering the questions. I think he's done a great job providing answers there uh, to some pretty tough questions in the end. Uh, there's a lot more to explore, uh, of course, in this area. Um, it, I, I like this, this research because it, it goes, it, it tackles classic um, hypotheses feedback in, in the SLA literature, things that we all teach at the beginning of every SLA course and Akira's out there kind of testing these principles uh, with state-of-the-art modern techniques here in 2022 and um, sometimes maybe a causing, causing these uh, old history books, I guess, as we call them, to be rewritten with uh, up-to-date concepts. So thanks so much. For that, I'm just going to briefly introduce our speaker for next week. Uh, we're back to a Friday session uh, on the, the 21st. And we've got Dr. James Thomas, who's the former director of MATSOL at the Webster University in Tashkent. He's going to discuss his experiences introducing corporate to language teachers. Uh, including a tool that he developed called uh, Versatext. So um, uh, 
it's going to be very interesting to have him on on what will be a session. But for now, uh, let's thank our speaker again, Akira. And uh, again, thank, thanks so much for appearing on the series and for giving us your time today. Well, thank you for coming to the talk and thank you for um, inviting me here. Thanks, Akira. Hopefully, I'll get to see you next year in person then. Sure. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to stop the recording here and we'll see you all next time.